Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the In Between. We're not really in between passages this week, uh, so this is going to be a very special episode. But I just wanted to give a huge thank you to Pastor Jerry for filling in for me this last week. He did an excellent job showing us the connect, grow, and serve that you see in all of our vision statements and mission statements and all that sort of thing here at Calvary, where we want to help people connect with Jesus and his church. We want them to grow in their walk with him, and we want to have them come alongside of us and us along alongside them and serve the Lord together. And I got to hear at the second service, Jerry does things a little bit different than I do, which is great. Um, we have two services. I typically preach the same sermon at both services, and what Jerry does is he preaches a different one in each service. So if you ever hear that Jerry's preaching, it, it may I think it's probably worth your time to go to both services, take a little break in between, and then come back. Uh, but at the second service, I got to specifically hear about serving. So thank you, Jerry. We love you. He, uh, if you don't know Jerry, you need to come by sometime, and I'll introduce him to you. He's actually, he and his wife started this church back in 1978, and so we are extremely extremely grateful for them being obedient to the Lord and being faithful for all those years. Uh, and then after he retired, I came here. Uh, and it's not often that you get to see a church with the founding pastor and the new pastor all in the same location, but Jerry and I have an excellent friendship, and I, he really means a lot to me, and so does his wife Frankie. So anyways, well, today's going to be just a little bit different. Since we're not in between two different passages, I wanted to do a special episode called The Cold Brew run through. The cold brew run through. So my wife is a coffee connoisseur. She loves making coffee. And this morning, she, well, I'll say she mixed this for me this morning. I wouldn't say that she made it this morning because this is actually some of her cold brew coffee that she likes to make every once in a while. We have a great big old pickle jar that she's cleaned out and cleaned out. So it doesn't, doesn't taste like pickle coffee. Uh, but she makes cold brew coffee sometimes days ahead of time because cold brew coffee takes some time to do. So this actually wasn't that made this morning, but I'm able to sip on it and enjoy it. And cold brew coffee, really, coffee in general, only has simple ingredients. This particular one has four simple ingredients. You have coffee, you have water, you have you can hear the ice in there, you have ice, and then you have cream, because I, I definitely, I like coffee with my creamer. You know what I mean? I'm that guy. My brother, on the other hand, he's like, just forget the creamer altogether. He's that kind of guy, uh, which there's nothing wrong with it. We'll pray for him later. But anyway, so my wife makes this four ingredients, coffee, water, ice, and cream. And it's very simple, but I get to sit and sip on it. And the reason that we're calling this cold brew run through is that with hot coffee, you got to drink it while it's hot if you're going to enjoy hot coffee. But you can sit and sip on the cold brew for a bit and enjoy the flavor, enjoy what's in it. And so when we look at scripture, that's kind of how we should be looking at, at scripture. We, we should sit and sip a while, enjoy what's in it, look at the word of God, which is incredibly simple for us to understand, but also very complex and with deep meaning that we can apply it to our lives and see transformation within our lives. And so today is the cold through run through and as you can see on the screen it's over the book of hebrews because we're going to be looking at the book of hebrews not not necessarily a, a sermon series but we're going to walk through the book of hebrews and so i thought it was important that today we look at some of the essential ingredients within hebrews and there's going to be four different things so if you are listening to this at work i can understand if you don't you're not able to write it down or you need to type it real quick so you may need to go back and listen to this uh, but if you're in a spot where you can type these things down, these are good things to look at for every book of the Bible. When you start to read a book of the Bible, these are going to affect how you read it. So number one, we'll look at author and audience. Who wrote it and who was it written to? Number two, we'll look at genre. So what kind of uh, message is it? Is it a letter or is it a, a from a prophecy or is it historical? Is it just a play-by-play -play of what's happening? So when we read the book of Acts, Acts is it is somewhat of a letter tr uh, trying to reach out and show this is what was happening, but you can see it's very play-by-play. -play. This is extremely historical of what happened, the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, but when you get to places like Galatians or First and Second Corinthians, First and Second Thessalonians, the, the epistles, the letters, 
letters. Uh, then you start to get into, well, this is more of a personal letter where there are times that the Apostle Paul, as he's writing to those different churches, uh, reveals the kind of relationship that he had with them. So, for example, when he writes to the Philippians, he tells them, I think about you guys all the time. I pray about you guys all the time. And I love you. I love the relationship that we have as brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, so genre, that's going to affect how we read this book. Then we also have the original purpose. Now, all of these have different titles that, that people like to say, uh, but I, I like to think of it as original purpose. So we know who it was written to, but why was it written to them? That changes how you end up reading a letter or reading a book of the Bible. And then lastly, we have current applications. Sometimes in our minds, we start to think, well, that's, we get like teenagers, right? Remember as teenagers, we looked at mom and dad and say, yeah, 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 I, your advice is great, but you're old. You, you don't know anything about my current context, my current situation that I'm going through. That's the beauty of scripture. That's the beauty. Remember, this is not just your parents here on earth talking. This is your heavenly father talking the word of God. And so it spans all time, all generations, all applications, all contexts, all languages, all backgrounds, everything. The word of God is applicable to absolutely everything. And so what we're going to do is we'll look at those things three first, author and audience, genre, and original purpose, but then we're able to take that and we're going to glean those what are called timeless principles or timeless truths from the scripture and apply it to our current context. So today's really a big overview, but if you have some coffee, especially if you got some cold brew, why don't you sit and sip with me for just a little bit and we'll get into the book of Hebrews. So the first thing we're going to look at is author and audience. Now, this is one of the books that does not have a clear author to it. There are some books in the Bible that will begin, uh, like uh, Galatians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, those sorts of things. Back in those days when they would write letters, they would sign it at the beginning and not at the end. And so we would know right off, okay, well, this one's from Paul, this one's from Peter, this one's from Luke. We, we can tell pretty quickly. There are other times that uh, scholars would have to see, okay, let's look at writing styles, let's look at grammar, let's let's look at the way that they have these conversations, who they're having them with, and then we can make some kind of um, educated guess at who this might be. But in reality, listen, even if the Bible didn't have anybody known as a source of who actually wrote it, because over time the Bible proves the Bible and the Word of God is powerful and the Holy Spirit moves. I know that sounds crazy to the world, but we can trust in Scripture. Scripture is going to support Scripture, and so they're able to look at the book of Hebrews and one one person says, only God knows who the author is, but we know that these are truths in that. There are some really good explanations as to why some people think that it was the Apostle Paul. There's also some really good explanations for people saying it wasn't the Apostle Paul. But when it comes to audience, we know that it was mainly written to Christian Hebrews based upon the themes that we end up reading. And we're going to get into those themes in just a moment. But those who used to be Jews who are now coming to faith in Jesus Christ are, is the audience of this book. And really, that can be applicable to all of us. We'll get into that as well. Now, the second thing that we want to look at is the genre. What, what kind of book of the Bible is this? Is this a historical book? Is it going to take us play by play? Is it an apocalyptic book? Is it a poetic book? Uh, can it, you know, for a poetic book, if we look at Psalms, Psalms has a lot of poetry within it. And so there are times that, you know, people on earth are called like grasshoppers. And you'll hear, well, they are as to or they are like. And so there's a lot of metaphorical or uh, imagery words that are being used within the, the poetry. Uh, when you look at apocalyptic, there's a, a lot of poetry type things in apocalyptic where there'll be a word picture of what's happening and that is supposed to point us to a, a certain historical thing that either has happened or will happen uh, and so forth. Uh, a good example of that would be the book of Daniel has a lot of apocalyptic writing in it. Uh, the book of Revelation, of course, that's like the number one our mind thinks of with apocalyptic writing. 
Uh, so this particular one is a letter. Now it doesn't necessarily start off that way as a letter. It just kind of hops right into Jesus's superior. When you look at chapter one of Hebrews, it talks about the superiority of Christ and then compares uh, Christ to the angels and says things like, you know, what, what angel did God say, you are my son? And what angel did he create the heavens for? And what angel did he create the earth for? You know, those, those types of things are showing up in chapter one. So it's not like having a signature at the beginning, but as the book moves forward, pretty much everyone is in agreement that this is a letter to those Christian Hebrews. You can hear the personal language within it, the direct language to it, and it was more than likely the reason they didn't have to sign it is that the people already knew who it was coming from and what was happening. There are possibilities like that. For example, if if I left a note on the coffee pot, <laughs> uh, if I left a note on the pickle jar <laughs> for my wife saying, I love you, I hope you have a good morning, I wouldn't have to sign it. Well, because our daughter can't write and our dog can't write as much as we'd like to pretend in our mind that Grunt Grunt can write and that Ada can write, they can't. So she would know right away, either somebody's broken into my house and said, I love you on the pickle jar, or that was probably my husband on, my, on his way to work. Um, which, by the way, Ashley, I love you so much. So anyways... That's the genre. That affects the way that we read this, that we can look at these things and say, yes, literally, this is who Jesus is. It's a, it's a teaching letter to these people and a letter of encouragement, and so we should be encouraged from it as well. Now, now that we have author and audience and genre, let's look at the original purpose. So uh, one commentator, William McDonald, he says this primarily deals with the issue of leaving Judaism for Christ. So shadows for substance, ritual for reality, good for the best. Uh, remember that the Israelites, the Jews, were the chosen people of God and that they were the people of the promise. And Jesus did come to the Jews first. When you look at John chapter 1, it says he came to his own, but his own rejected him. It was his own people who put Jesus on the cross. And so these people are rooted in tradition. They're rooted in the things that for so many years that they have called good. And it becomes a way of life because it was saturated within their society. It was the their society. When you look at the Old Testament, when God gave the law to the people, there were some laws that were ceremonial laws within the temple, but there was also laws that were societal laws. This is how you are to govern one another. This is how you are to deal with judgments or criminals or, or land deals. This is how you're to deal with all of it. And that's what God had given to his people. But what the author is pointing out is that those things, just as Jesus said, this is how we can have some reliability with this letter. Jesus said that those were just a shadow of what is to come. They were foreshadowing and pointing towards Jesus. So, for example, the sacrificial system, well, Jesus was that final and perfect sacrifice on the cross. Man couldn't make that sacrifice. A bull couldn't, couldn't uh, be that ultimate atoning sacrifice for us. But the whole sacrificial structure we see being fulfilled within Jesus. And so the author of Hebrews is trying to point them saying, look, that was all stuff that is good. It wasn't that it's done and gone away with. It's that it's fulfilled and now no longer needs to be a part of that. Don't hang on to that plus Christ. You can have societal things and traditional things like, you know, for example, my family, uh, I'm sure at one time there was some rule out there that people were like, well, we're all going to meet at the dinner table on Sunday or we're going to meet at the dinner table every single week. Well, my family, what, that wasn't a hard and fast rule, but we knew that on Sundays after church, we're not going to go out to eat. We're going to sit at the dinner table and eat together. Is that dishonoring to God? No, it's a fun tradition at Christmas time. We always open one gift on Christmas Eve and then the rest on Christmas morning. If Christmas morning was on a Sunday, we typically would have Christmas on a Saturday because my dad was the pastor. Is that dishonoring to God? No. However, when we say that those things plus Jesus are the things that are going to save us and bring us through and we need to persevere in these, that's when it's dishonoring to God because it is Jesus Christ plus minus nothing equals everything. Now, that's not my own phrase, okay? Many pastors have said that before, but think of that in your mind. Jesus Christ plus minus, so don't add anything, don't take anything away, 
equals everything. And so the author is dealing with two groups here. He's dealing with those who are true believers, telling them, you need to persevere in this, you need to press forward in this, and then those who just look like it, those who are pretending. Now, the more we talk about this book, do you kind of see how we're getting to that current application? Don't we have those kind of people here today? Uh, and I'm not, I'm not just talking about Calvary Baptist Church. I'm not trying to nitpick on people. I'm talking about in the whole world. There are those who act like Christians, and then there's, there are those who are Christians. And listen, I'm telling you something. Oh, I have seen it when that COVID lockdown stuff happened. It, the Lord was doing a, a healthy pruning. He was doing a weeding out because you knew the people who were just acting like Christians and just coming to church from time to time versus the people who were true believers and had trusted in the Lord through all of that. The fruits will show. They, We will know. All of us will know. And others will know from us that we are Christians by our love and how we are reflecting Jesus. So that brings us to our current application here. Okay, so the current application that we are starting to see, some of the timeless principles, are number one, denying the old and the self. So not just denying the old things, but literally denying the self where I'm not trying to make up new things in order to cling to. It's no longer about me. That's really what sin was. Sin sin is a rebellion against God, but it is incredibly selfish. All the sins, if you look at the Ten Commandments and it says, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not have any other idols, that uh, thou shalt honor thy father and mother. Well, when we break those commandments, how selfish is that? So murder is I don't want to wait on God's timing for that for justice to be served towards that person. I want to enact my own justice, my own sense of justice, and we're going to go wild west over here. Uh, when we commit adultery, and it's not just men with the lust of the eyes. There are plenty of women out there who struggle with that same problem. When they commit adultery within their heart and they look after somebody else, they're also breaking that covenant of uh, or that promise of thou shall not covet. They look after them so much, and it's all about the self. And so part of what this book deals with is not just denying the old sinful things, but denying the self in exchange for Jesus. So that's the other things it deals with is clinging to Jesus. This world is falling apart, and it's been falling apart for a long time. And folks, I'm here to tell you, I love to break it to you. It's not that I hate to break it to you. I want to break it to you so that you know who to turn to. This world is only going to get worse, and we need to cling to Jesus because persecution is also going to increase. So it's not just speaking to those who are lost and in need of a Savior that they should deny the old self and they should cling to Jesus. This is talking to the believer as well, saying we need to persevere in the face of persecution. So Here's what I want you to do in between our time today and Sunday, just to kind of help you walk through your own Bible. I want you to take your own Bible and look at Hebrews chapter 1. Just read through Hebrews chapter 1. It's pretty quick. Uh, you'll see the superiority of Christ. You'll see even a little warning there right after that. Uh, but there's also, in your Bible, you may have noticed that there's headings for each little section in the Bible. And so I want you to read Hebrews chapter 1, but then I also want you to do just kind of an overall scan of the book. See what's coming up. It's not that you have to get into it deep, that you have to understand all of it, but it'll kind of prepare your heart and prepare your mind. And speaking of preparing your heart for this Sunday, since this book is all about denying the self, clinging to Jesus, and persevering in the face of persecution... Uh, here's a question for you, okay? Do you have things you're hanging on to? Do you have things that you're hanging on to? So are there things in your life that don't reflect Jesus, that don't look like Jesus, and you're hanging on to them because of tradition, because they used to bring you comfort, uh, for, for whatever reason? I could make up a million reasons, and I'm sure not cover some of the reasons that you may have given for hanging on to that one thing. Now, it's okay if you want to have tradition. Like in my family, we don't listen to Christmas music until after Thanksgiving. For Terry Watts, <laughs> we're still praying for her, but she loves to listen to Christmas music all year long. 
But like I said earlier, it's not that we take that and say, I need this plus Jesus. So this question is specifically looking at, is there anything in your life that you're hanging on to saying, I need this and Jesus together. My life's not going to make it if I don't have these two things together. If you are living your life that way, it's time to let this one go. It's time, it's time to release to this one and cling to Christ. Cling to Christ. And you know what? That begins with uh, observing your own heart, finding that thing you're clinging to, and then turning to Jesus and saying, Lord, I trust you with this. Or if you're struggling to trust, maybe you have trust issues, and, or you're a brand new believer in Jesus, and you just you don't know what that looks like. Here's, here's how you can look at it, too. You turn to Jesus and you say, Jesus, I want to trust you with this. I don't want to hang on to it anymore. I want to let go, and I want you to take care of it. And I know what your Bible says. I know what your Word says. I know what the Holy Spirit says. I've heard what that preacher boy has to say, and I want that, but I need your help. Help me to trust you. Help me to be obedient. Because it's a good thing to let go and just hang on to the hand of Jesus. I'll leave you with this one last thing. You know about my favorite preacher. I love listening to him is Adrian Rogers. That's something that me and my grandma have in common. I love listening to Adrian Rogers. He's He's been in heaven now for the last almost 20 years but yet his sermons are still available and i encourage you go go look him up i may leave a link in the description for you to one of his sermons just so you can listen to him but i remember he was talking about money and so this, it's a little bit different uh but he had everybody in the audience hold their hand real tight he said get it as tight as you can i mean look at that it's starting to turn red he said get it as tight as you can hold it and he had him hold it and hold it, and hold it, and hold it, and hold it. Oh, till the point he could see their faces. It was starting to hurt them. And, you know, some of those ladies' nails were a little bit longer. And, oh, my goodness, it was just getting so tight. And then he goes, now let it go. How does that feel? That's exactly what it's supposed to look like when we let go and we trust Jesus. We're clinging for dear life to that old self. But when we let go, oh, boy, does it feel good. Well, just know I'm excited to go through this book of Hebrews with you. I would love to see you on Sunday at 8.15 or 11. We have a ton of things going going on in and around Calvary Baptist Church. So if you'd like more information on some of our small groups, uh, some of the events that are going to be happening, I know we have a ladies' event coming up, a spiritual gifts workshop that I'd love for all of you ladies to be at. Uh, our men's Bible study on Monday nights is getting ready to go through a new book called The Measure of a Man, and, and I would love for you to come to that as well. Uh, even if you miss out the first couple of weeks, hop right in. It's always designed so that you can hop right in. But guys, I don't want you to miss out, and I can't wait to see you on Sunday. Now, to enjoy the coffee.